Good morning. Uh, we are sitting today at the Town Hall Selectman's uh, room, and today we are interviewing Helen Clary and Nancy Connors. Uh, Betty and, and Bonnie and I decided to use this room because Helen was a select woman in the 60s. Is that correct? So we're going to start today by asking you uh, how many years you've lived in Norfolk and what brought you to this lovely little town. Helen, would you like to start? Well, I've been here since the fall of 1947, which comes to 62 years, if I can add. Oh my God. Um, I did not intend to live here. Um, my brother and I were leaving home, and my mother loved the country. She did, we lived in Brookline born and raised in Brookline, uh, and so we came out kind of to get her settled. I went off to graduate school, all got married, and after graduate school I planned on working in New York. But I came to visit, and I too love the country. I would much rather have lived where I live than in an apartment in New York with no trees, no air, too many people, too much. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a country girl at heart. So that's how I came. And stayed. And stayed. <laughs> and stayed. Yeah. And stayed. Right. Nancy? Well, my husband came to Norfolk at, at five years old, out of South Boston, mm -hmm. and lived across the street from where we are now. Wow. Um, so we did some of, we got married in 1955 and we were looking for a house lot to build our own home. Rentham was my first choice. We couldn't afford it. Walpole was my second choice. We couldn't afford it. Franklin was my third choice. <laughs> Finally, Richard said, you know there's a lot of land on Everett Street. I said, Everett Street. <laughs> there was no town water, still isn't. No town sewerage, still isn't. A little skinny type road. The rest of the neighborhood was nowhere near what it is now. Uh, and you had to drive at least six miles, no, maybe eight, round trip, to even get a loaf of bread or a quart of milk. So I went in the, we, my father came down and looked at it and said, oh, and the train went through the backyard, which set off in the fall, little mini fires. And of course, no water. We'd go down with shovels and shovel dirt on these little sparks. My father came down and he said, I was going to lend you kids money, but he said, not here. <laughs> Not for here. <laughs> anyway, so we did build and we did uh, move there. And I'll be truthful with you now, for years when somebody would say, where do you live? I'd go, no, no. <laughs> now I say, oh, we have, we have about an acre of land in Norfolk. <laughs> <laughs> were you born in Boston area, though? Rentham. In I Rentham? I was a Rentham girl. Oh, you were a Rentham girl. And how did you meet your husband? I was a senior in high school, and he was a freshman at PC College. And my girlfriend hooked us up together, give me a ride back to boarding school while he went back to college. And I hated him for at least six months. <laughs> at least. We became friends. And then friends became lovers. And he's still my best friend, 56 years later. Wow. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. And Helen, I understand you were a Marine? Yes, yes. I was in when the Marine. When did you do this? In when? World War II. Oh my. Before you moved here then? Well, I joined before we moved here, yes. Yeah. yeah. And where did you, did you, were you I was stationed at the in different places? places at Cherry Point, North Carolina. Uh, I ran the communication center there, uh, you know, where you got all the news that was fit to print for distribution throughout the bases. Oh my goodness. So that's why you write so many wonderful letters in the, in the paper. You are a good communicator in the newspaper. Did you, did you like to write? Is this something that, why did you? No, uh, well I don't mind writing some things. I, I'm not a creative writer because mm -hmm. I wouldn't write a novel. But if you're talking about issues, mm -hmm. uh, that I understand. That's mm -hmm. the kind of thing mm -hmm. that I'm likely to write about. Interesting. How many years were you a Marine? Well, I, I stayed in for my 20 years because after World War II, I was still in. I didn't know that. Um, that was okay with me because I love the Marine Corps. There is, you know, you hear about this esprit de corps. It's real. There's something about that 
Auschwitz that when it gets in your blood and you never lose it to this day. If I hear the Marine Corps uh, yeah. criticized, I am prepared to say, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> but, she, and she can do it. <laughs> Were you stationed the whole 20 years in oh, the no, Carolinas? No, 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 no. I was on active duty during the war. When the war was over, you went on inactive duty, but then they had uh, all over the country in, in, under the heading of preparedness, um, units, uh, laymen met, it's like the National Guard, you know, they met either one night a week or weekends or whatever to stay up, uh, up with the, uh, the current issues. So should there be need, there, are, there would be a cadre of people available. So I had a, um, a reserve unit in Boston, which is attached to the 2nd Infantry Battalion for, I can't remember whether it's four or five years they allowed you to, to uh, be CO of a, of a unit, but it was for, and uh, I still see people involved in that and in World War II. Uh, there's, uh, you, there, you make friendships in that environment that I've never quite tried to articulate this before, but somehow it doesn't make any difference what they do or don't do. They're a buddy, mm -hmm. and you don't ever lose that. Uh, four or five of us after everybody's kids were grown and uh, we traveled for oh, 10, 12 years every year, we went someplace, and that was from World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you had put us together in civilian life, I would have said, no, 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 no. But there's something, something about what you do mm -hmm. um, that, that keeps you tied up. Mm -hmm. so emotionally, uh, to this day, we talk mm -hmm. on the phone. Those that are still alive, and there aren't many alive mm -hmm. anymore. Now, how That's many funny. women were in your uh, where you were located. The, you mean the, the reserve unit yeah. in Boston? We're at the Fargo building in South Boston, if anybody knows, remembers that. It's long since been torn down. It was a Navy building not in South Boston. I'm trying to think, maybe a hundred. Oh, really? Yeah. That's amazing. It was a wonderful, I found that a wonderful training ground for these kids right out of high school who didn't know who they were or what they wanted. And you know, we, we had our standards. If you come in, this is required. Mm -hmm. and, and we never wavered on those standards. And it was good for them, because mm -hmm. they, they needed to learn a little bit of discipline. That was my experience with them. They were great kids. We had a lot of fun. Ships would come into Boston and they'd want to have a party for the, <laughs> of course, for the boys. So, you know, I would ask them if they want to, show sure. up. And it was fun, we did that a few times. But one of the gals, one day when I was explaining what ship, which I couldn't remember for my life at the moment, and where it was gonna be and what, what our transportation was gonna be in the whole bit. She stood up and she said, well, what happens if I get somebody I don't like? I said, tell me, that's life, kid. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, that, that was for me a very, very enriching experience and I think it was for a lot of them too. Oh, that's good. And Nancy, tell me about some of the organizations that you were involved in in Norfolk well, or, or you had mentioned some of the departments. Or the yeah, Richard and I, as I say, we were on Everett Street and driving down into Plunville area. Um, it was a desolate area. There was no development. There was a sand pit, which as you drove by, sometimes with the wind, you'd end up with this glistening off your car. Uh, then there was a Baptist camp on the left-hand side of 115, just before Everett Street, which was where they brought children out during the summer for a summer break. And it wasn't a very overly functional area, but it was still functional. And then on Valley Street uh, was the duck farms. 
and there were great, great big buildings, four and five stories, at least it looked to me as a, as a young lady, uh, with the ducks. This was a big thing. And they also were aware uh, during the war, of course, the ducks were a valuable bit of meat. And that also supplied the Weber Duck Inn, which was a very, very popular restaurant at yeah. its time, off Route 1 in Norfolk, up in the hills, it's defunct now. Very famous, very famous. Oh, that was one on Route 1A. Route 1A. Oh, 1A. Okay. I've been, and, and I think it's called, it's a development of homes now, and I believe, believe I still use the Weber Duck oh, Inn type thing. That's in been fact, there for a very long time. A very long what? time. In fact, my husband, as a young man, uh, worked for five cents an hour shoveling the things that needed to be moved <laughs> after the ducks and he walked down and yes and he said that at night you had to get the ducks back in off the pond and some of them would, would malinga so he'd throw a stone behind them to try and kind of drive them forward well one day evidently he hit one of the ducks and of course down it went and Mr. Sharon saw him he said that's your day's pay get out of here well then he called him back the next day and it, as his mother said, he'll call you. Who's he going to get for five cents an hour? <laughs> <laughs> well, my husband was a big entrepreneur in Norfolk early on. <laughs> but you know, I wrote a letter to the selectmen concerned about the development that was starting there, a, a, a used car salesman at the corner of 1A and 115. Who, who can operate out of, excuse the expression, an outhouse? Now that tax to the town is a yeah. An eight by five building or something. Just he needs to get out of the coal with some records, that's all. But you're tying up the lot with all of the stock. I thought this is a waste. I wrote a letter to the selectman, in fact I threw it away a few years ago, but it said, and to the planning board, please hold back on the development you're allowing at 1A and 115. 1A and 115 is Norfolk's pot of gold, but it's being treated as an albatross. And you know what? I was right. Look at the development yeah, we yeah. have there now. That's our best income to this town mm -hmm. in industrial development and businesses. Just a few, and I probably will skip some, is the uh, Four Kicks, Joffrey, Hydro Seeding, Tedeschi's building, and not all of that business there, several in it, North Fork Glass, Rico Places. That's only a touch the top of the, the maybe two to three businesses were there, or restaurants. One of them wasn't even a restaurant years ago. It was the, oh, the one that sells green, grilled Gilmore's and so forth, uh, is where one of those restaurants were. And one of the restaurants is where the, uh, the uh, painting of, of t-shirts and uh, a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. That was one of the big restaurants years ago, called Mal Arms. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, 1A and 115, and then of course off of 1A and 115 is the industrial development way up in the woods now with some very large buildings being constructed, which of course is wonderful. It's tax return to our town and no children to educate. It's a very, very big That's thing. Very it's an important thing. Yes, it is. Well, Norfolk ha does not have enough industry, does not have enough, but this area is really our, our part of gold. It's mm -hmm. Sicilia, yes. and I'm, I'm proud that we fought, my husband and I both, to stop some other developments. That's how I uh, got on the Zoning Board of Appeals years ago. Uh, development was putting in this inexpensive, cheap looking, uh, we saw the picture, strip mall. Now at that time, Norfolk had no controls for, develop, for landscaping, for hardwood, for parking, for um, any of the things we have today, setbacks, noise, everything. So you could put up any kind of a building, mm -hmm. anywhere. Either you could landscape it or you could put in crushed stone, which was a lot of that, or dirt to drive in. It was awful. So we got a whole bunch of people together to come and stop this particular development. Well, it was coming through the ZBA. And the ZBA, I think, was overextended for those that were on it. So my husband said, look, why don't you get on this? I said, oh, we'll <laughs> So I sat down with the attorney of our, uh, no, that was later on, I'm sorry. I, I got out this new book which explained 40A, which hadn't been implemented yet, though, the, though it had been in, law, in force for a few months. But to make a long story short, I said, look, this is what we need to do. Well, I guess I scared everybody when I said it's ABC, where you're not working. They all quit but one. <laughs> I thought, mm, this is not too good. <laughs> to make a long story short, we did get some newer people in. Uh, I got Mr. Santos, Joe Santos, our attorney at the time for our town, who was a wonderful man. I said, look, we're all virgins at this. Would you come please and educate us? 
So he came, he gave us three sessions where he would sit with the board. Oh, I taped, yeah, we've got to learn how to do this right. Sure. Well, I taped each of the sessions, and as a new member would come in, I'd give them the tape to learn. And I can remember uh, Alan Mackey was chair of the selectmen once, and I forget, he did something, and oh, okay, well, close the hearing. Now we'll go down and take a look at the uh, clam alarms, I think it was. And I, I said, Alan, you cannot take any information after hearing this close. <coughs> I've learned this from my town council. If you receive a letter afterward, you cannot open it. Don't even open it. I won't say, geez, Nancy. I said, yeah. So anyway, Joe Santos was a very good teacher, and, and we did learn. And yeah, I think that, we uh, hired Joe Santos because of the Kingsbury Pond water problem. Yes, he was, um, that's right. He was in when you were here, Helen. Right, well, yeah, I hired him because the town council that we had was, a, he didn't get into that kind of business. He was an old country lawyer, and he dealt with the prosaic kind of stuff. But when it came to... Uh, suing another town for destroying your pond mm -hmm. and pr property values. He just wasn't with it. So I hired Joe, God, he was marvelous. He was he a was, good, good, he good was attorney. absolutely wonderful. Very good. And yeah. Helen, how long were you a select woman? Just six years, or two terms. Mm -hmm. That was enough. Just? Yeah. That's not just. That's a lot of work, Helen. That is a, a long order. commitment. Now, what would you say that issue, the water issue, was your major issue during those six years? Yeah, it really was because uh, in addition to the Kingsbury Pond uh, problem, reducing that pond uh, from, from uh, how much was it, 20, no, 40 acres or something, reduced in half the size. And of course, the houses along the side a lot of which had been just summer cottages and people had created winter homes. Them. Um, their wells were destroyed. But and their docks were high and dry. Their, their, their docks were high and dry. Well, the other piece of that, which we don't hear much about today, um, Emil Petrovic was a member of the Board of Selectmen and there was the issue of town water. The only town water available was in the center and that was prison water which we bought from them. Now, that has been reversed at this point, but that's all that was available. And especially for the downtown area, people were, were looking because everybody couldn't have a well and a septic system on their property. So Emil um, got a hold of Senator Kennedy's office and um, identified some money that would have given the town uh, a water system in total for the entire town. Uh, we couldn't sell it to the town. Absolutely could not sell it. I think we had three town meetings to try to convince people that development is going to come to this town, ladies and gentlemen. You can't avoid it. Why are they building supermarkets in Walpole and Franklin? Who's going to shop at these supermarkets? This area is going to grow. And at that time, uh, the Mass Municipal Association, and they may not still call it that, said that the uh, center of the Megadop okay, metropolis from <laughs> Boston and Providence was at 1A and 115, and that has proven to be true. Sure. So there certainly was going to be development. So now, if we could get the water and we could set up our zoning laws and it's to control this, uh, otherwise, it's going to be hit or miss. We could not have three town meetings. The people at that time were still in the mode that they were in when I came here. This was a little country town. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely nothing you could buy in town. Nothing. No gas, no groceries, nothing. You went everything, you got everything out of town. So none of this downtown, what we call our downtown, there was nothing there uh, for you, like, uh, uh, besides there, the post later office? Later on, there were. Uh, Two or three came. But when I came in 47, there was nothing. And, and, and I think it was in 50, Walford Carlson, Carlson Circle. There used to be a lumber yard on Carlson Circle. And Walford Carlson was an immigrant from Sweden who had a lumber business in West Roxbury and he moved it out here. Um, he was a very hard-working, very tough subject. Uh, but he was honest, and he said to the selectmen, 
we need some stores in town here. And I'd like to build some, but I would like to take Town Hill down because, I mean, you couldn't walk on Town Hill in those days. It was high. Mm -hmm. That was sacred ground. You couldn't touch it. <laughs> the selectmen <laughs> wouldn't let him do it. But the Too real bad, reason really, was you know? that the, here was this foreigner, this sweet, coming to this wasp town and saying to the selectmen, you need this. How dare he do that? How dare he do that? That was, there was, there was a lot of that kind of mm -hmm. prejudice around at that time. But in any Limited. event, so that's why he you built were. them where they are right mm. now. He wanted to fill that in and build them in back because before he did this, you got off the train and there was a lovely green lawn and right at the corner of uh, Maine and 115 was a lovely old white country house with the porch and oh. it was yeah. just, it was, very pretty. it was delightful. Uh, and then it got replaced with these stores. And Walford was correct in terms of the need for the stores, but he didn't have much class in the way he built them. So, uh, <laughs> but in any event, a uh, bit of slapstick together, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so then we could buy things in town. But, you know, not really. The post office was there. It was a grocery store. And I can't remember what all else. A great variety of things mm -hmm. have been in there over the years. So you've seen, all, both of you have seen a lot of changes to the center. Yes. Well, I can remember when we were interviewing Helen to see if we were, I, would, I was working on her campaign at my house, as I told you the story that we had moved into the house just a bit ago. We had no furniture in the living room and dining room yet. We only had family room. Uh, so I called the local undertaker in Renton and borrowed, <laughs> <laughs> borrowed folding chairs so that we could have a coffee to Helen Cleary because I was very impressed with her. Um, I've worked on her selectman's campaign every year since, but anyway. Um, so I said to her, you know, nobody recognizes us here at Pondville. That's it, at Pondville area. They don't know more. Miss Cleary said, that's what I hear from Leland, Le Leland Road. That's what I hear from uh, on the other side of town, but Mira Lake Little area. Hill. This is what I hear from, that's your problem here in North Rock. You're all neighbors. You're all whatever. She gave it to me. And you know what she got through? I thought, you know what? She's right. We are all. And, and stuff, well, I'm plundering you know, All right. She said, that's what's wrong. You're all members of this town. They've got to learn to work together and, and get things done together rather than each his own. Remember that speech you yeah. gave me? Yeah. I thought, wow, and I'm going to vote for her. She just scolded me. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, that was an awakening. That is true. That was, that was very good. Yeah, that and I never forgot that. that. I never forgot that. That, that, that was that. absolutely true. Yeah. So, but so the, um, what is now called the Old Town Hall uh, was um, the fire station mm -hmm. uh, and the police station. And the rooms upstairs were used for meetings of selectmen. For the selectmen meeting. And other. Uh, but most of the town employees uh, in fact, at that time, I think almost all of them worked out of their homes. Uh, the town clerk at that time was G.F. Campbell, who lived across the street from the police station. And that oversized garage there, if you had any town business to it transact, in boxes. you went to see G.F. Campbell. That, that's where it was carried out. Um, Bill Coughlin, who was the um, Accountant. Accountant. Town accountant. And we've never had a better one. A real it was gentleman. all done by hand. Oh my goodness. Yes. He, was, yep. he lived over at Merrill yep. Lake. And eventually, I remember the night he came into the selectmen's meeting and said, I just want you to know that our expenses have just gone over a million dollars. Times have changed. They yes. have definitely changed. Times have changed. changed. Definitely. Um, and eventually, Bill got a assistant, Lorraine Foley, who was another gem. Lived up on Park Street. Her husband was a farmer. Uh, and Lorraine did her work at the kitchen table. And that's, that's how the town. But it worked for, mm -hmm. for those days. Um, the earliest town meetings that I remember were when the Freeman School was built and the town meeting was held in Washburn Hall. Uh, and um, the one town meeting that I'll never forget was uh, 
we had one police officer in town. Oh my God! Twenty-four hour duty, amazing. and uh, there had been an accident uh, the night before town meeting, I think. So he got up and he had to have another cop. He just had to have another cop. And I said, "But that's only once." Well. People are, you know, we're getting more people around here and we need another one. Uh, and of course there was no, no looking at this from any um, budget perspective other than his. And that's kind of the way the town was mm -hmm. run. So we got another call. Uh, I always remember, because we had a volunteer fire department. Mm -hmm. yeah. Totally. All volunteer. Yeah. And mm -hmm. when there was a fire, the whistle would blow. And there were a lot of people in town that would call up Dottie Campbell, who was a dispatcher, and the sister, I think, of the cop. I never got those relationships straight, but it's unimportant. And say, Dottie, where's the fire? Or if you heard the ambulance going out, who's in the ambulance? What's happened? So you got your news if you if you called her. You know? But wasn't there the alarm, Helen, was blown one, two, three for a certain area. Yeah, yes, right. It, so there was a code in this boom, oh. boom, boom. That meant certain areas in town are where oh. the fire volunteers would go. Because Richard and I would sit and come, you know, and where, we knew where, where, where the locust yeah. was. What, yeah. The area. That, that's what the area, area of, of, of the town. See, I'm old too, Kevin. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, and people got used to this, this uh, kind of place they fail way. Mm -hmm. Of, of, of running running the government. Uh, it started to change in the 80s. We missed the earlier development because we had no town water and we had no town storage. So the developers bypassed us for Franklin mm -hmm. and uh, some of the other towns around here. And all I could say was, thank God, keep going. Because we needed time, Helen. This is why Franklin, to, to me, I. I, I don't mean to offend Franklin, but I was glad that we couldn't afford to find a place mm -hmm. in Franklin. It it does not have the control that it should have had. It went so fast, yeah, so much. Yeah. Too much. Fortunately, not far. Yeah. Uh, we we have people complain about you know all the rules and regulations, but you know they're needed. When I drive down now, 1A and 115, I, I still almost feel like I should have the sand blowing on me. But I look over at this beautifully landscaped building, Joffrey and the four kicks also, and now uh, Ross goes, and it's, I, I slow down because I honestly, sincerely appreciate the work that went into this for the developer, but also for the town said, we'll work with you, but this is what we need you to do, and this is what we need it to look like. And that balance, I think, is wonderful. I know our town gets criticized, oh, this board's too much and that board's too much, and that might be this much true, but overall, these boards are working to protect us, the town, not to the new person, not to the developer. Let them come in and develop within our means. They're not going to get hurt, but we're not either, and that's mm -hmm. important. Well, development has its assets and liabilities. One thing I miss that the growth has sort of taken away, at least for me, um, there were no more than a dozen houses on Murray Street, it's a couple of miles long. Uh, you knew everyone who lived on the street. Uh, if there was ever a problem, you need, didn't need to worry because somebody would come and help. In the 78 hurricane, plow wouldn't take snow out of my driveway nor anybody else's. We needed a front end loader. So, one morning. So I think you referred to the blizzard phone. You said hurricane. Did I say hurricane? Yeah. Blizzard. 78. I think you meant blizzard. Okay. Yeah. Well, the reason. You know I'm going to pick same. on you. I mean, I didn't want you to miss me. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep seven, it straight. 78, the 78 blizzard. Yeah. There's a front end loader out there uh, getting the snow out of my driveway. Uh, and then the next day, I looked out and this little girl is walking on top of the snow. She was probably eight years old. My other neighbor brought her daughter down, took the mail out of my mailbox, gave it to her because she could walk down and bring it in. Uh, when my mother died, it was November, and we hadn't finished breaking the leaves. 
I looked out that morning, there's my neighbor and his son breaking up the leaves. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask them. No, I missed that. True. That's true. I mean, everybody minded their own business, but you didn't have to ask. Everybody chipped in to help. People, people were there for it. I don't even, I hate this. I don't even know who lives on that street anymore. Mm -hmm. I always made an effort when somebody moved in to call on them just to introduce myself. And uh, lately, um, I stopped because they wonder why you're bothering. Right. <laughs> what are you selling? <laughs> they, um, you never see them again. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know them if I tripped over them on the street. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's lonesome. That is sad. That yeah. is true. Yeah, that I really, true. I really miss that kind of neighborliness. It's not nosy. And nobody is interfering. Mm -hmm. Nobody's knocking at your door for a cup of coffee all the time. People mind their own business, but they're there. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, but we, Helen, some of it, don't you think, is the way of life today? Oh yeah, Let's they move it, in and they move right. out. The transient executive, plus the fact that so many of the women are working. They're not home to bake exactly. some muffins and cookies yeah, and yeah, bring I them take to time you. To, They're yeah. off themselves. I, They're I, not there. I, I understand that, Nancy. I, I do understand that. I'm not blaming them. Mm. It's their way of life. But they could come after work, right? No. <laughs> But they could be more neighborly. Everybody could be more neighborly, yeah. I think, in yeah. today's world. We're kind of lucky on Everett Street. We still have quite a bit of that. That's we really do. And we make sure that we open the door first, but others keep it open. Sure. Nancy, can you just tell us a little bit about what it was like when you first built your house on Everett Street and what your neighborhood was like in those days? Yes, there was a very un unattractive home across the street, which was abandoned. Um, well, Richard's parents lived in one house, and then as they, the children moved away, they just moved next door into a smaller one. But Everett Street was a small, narrow, curvy road, uh, very narrow. It was had bumps and everything in it. Well, then, all of a sudden, the Patriot place developed, just the football place. Well, we learned very quickly <laughs> that the children's rule was you don't play in the front yard during a Patriot game, everybody in the back. Because of that corner and the amount of alcohol right. that was consumed, I guess they've tightened up on it, but it averaged to three to four accidents a year in front of the corners. And we are on a slight curve. And before they corrected the road, the curve was not good. It needed work. And so when I would call, Nancy Connors Crash Connors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They got to know me as crash corners. Uh, an ambulance or a tow truck? No, just a tow truck. I mean, it got standard. It was so bad. We, our telephone pole never got old. In fact, it still isn't. And uh, I can remember they came and, you know, it's tough to maneuver those great big poles past the wires, right. past the whatever. Mm -hmm. And they had been at my house maybe three times over two or three years. And I waited till they finally had it just about right. And I opened the door and I yelled, stop, no, wait. And then, what's the matter, lady? I said, I ordered a light gray one. That's brown. <laughs> I brought them all out coffee, you know. So every time they come by now, they toot and wave. <laughs> and our mailbox, of course, has been upgraded several times. I don't know oh, how much sure. more expensive we could get one, unless we got one in ivory or something, because that keeps getting knocked out. Most times we can find who's done, sometimes we have it. I'll tell you one quick story. This guy came into the front and dug up all the myrtle and so forth. And wheels will back out again. And uh, so we went down and we reported it. And, the and Richard said he was waiting for the police report. And we kept going down. There was no police report, no police report. <coughs> so they said, well, we don't have any idea who did it. Well, Richard said, I think we do. The car door opened and stuff fell out into our myrtle. And there was a picture of the two people who were oh, coming God, from a party. But he just happened to be a state trooper. <laughs> I, I think I'm sure that our police department was looking very hard to find this. <laughs> and when Richard went down with, well, I think this is what they look like. Oh, <laughs> but anyway, it, it still is. Now we've had two accidents within the last month on the corner and again. So the more this Patriot place develops, the more difficult. In fact, 
it's really ruined the little country road. I was going to say, so this was a really little country road that the children yeah. could go out. Oh, absolutely. It's quite hopscotch yeah. in the street. Yeah. And then, okay, we'll move over. When the, now you can't get out of your driveway yeah. right. after a concert or a game. Now, Richard and I went to the Foxborough Planning Board as this was developing knowing that perhaps this it would impact us. We've become Route 1A, Route 1B. Evan Street is Route 1B. And do you think they wanted to listen to us? In fact, I'm sorry to say it, and, and if you can take me to court, Franklin, Foxborough. <laughs> you closed that hearing illegally. We tried to say, Mr. Kraft has a million dollars, come on, give us extra police, at least during things in Norfolk. We can't strain it. anything. They, nothing, absolutely nothing. So we've been working for two or three years with our selectmen to see what we can do. We had suggestions, which of which from Butch Vito, which I thought was great, close off Ever Street. There's plenty of other ways oh, okay. to get, close it off at the end. That would be the best, but of course that isn't going to happen. Uh, but we finally did get stop signs. Stop signs, I was just going to say. We have, you know, one stop step. Signs. Now they're working on these great big trucks that finds it easier to come down Everest Street. Mm. Aside from the fact of the danger and the wear and the effect on a closely developed neighborhood, mm -hmm. which it is, they're inundating our roads, which of course is expensive. And we didn't pass the road thing at the last town meeting. When your roads break down and those big trucks are doing a heck of a job. Our yellow lines fade within four months. They're just mm -hmm. gone. You know. And it is too bad. It really is has an awful effect on our neighborhood and I think on the value of our homes. Mm -hmm. If you are moving into our neighborhood, looking at it as it is today, with children, I think you might look a little differently. Yeah, right. I really sure. do. Yeah. It's really sure. a shame. I mean, to go across the street, my neighbors have had their mailbox moved to the, their side of the street. But I, they're a little more elderly than I, but maybe a few more years I might not be able to make it. But, uh, <laughs> and that's too bad. It's yeah. really, really a shame that somebody else is profiting a great deal while Norfolk Ever Street is losing. And I know that uh, uh, our chief says, well, you know, every neighborhood's complaining about traffic. I believe they are. The town has developed. But not where the effect is on Ever yeah, Street. It's a whole different market. Mm -hmm. It isn't only during games mm -hmm. anymore. They're going to the theater. I've had people mm -hmm. ask me, is this the way to, they're shopping, they're going to the theater, they're going to all the concerts, mm -hmm. they're going to, and it's really, it's really a shame. Yeah. Alan, you had mentioned um, about the sense of community and that, that you miss having the neighborly feeling where people looked after you, everybody, and, and everything. And, and I think that is really part of that centennial um, celebration mm -hmm. that they had here there must have been a sense of community where everybody chipped in and everybody had fun involved yep. working on some aspect of it. Can you share some of the stories? I don't have a lot of stories with that because that was 1970 and that was my third year of the three years working on my doctorate and oh, I goodness. was, I had no, uh, I had very little time. <laughs> now where can I just interject here, what was your doctorate in? In the public health. Um, so I, I really had, I knew all of this was going on, mm -hmm. but um, my, I, I was very focused for those three years, mm -hmm. and I had, I really had very little time to participate in it. But so she you notice how well she hides this doctorate. She I'm, hides it. So we should be calling you Doctor, Doctor Cleary. You notice how well she hides this? I yes. Don't, I don't use it in the community. It's a professional title, and I use it professionally, but I don't use it personally, because people think then you're a medical doctor, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't wish to be thought of as a medical doctor. Well, maybe the, the discussion should be about her professional life. Just tell us a little bit about what you, your profession. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, it's, it's public health with an emphasis with a on the teaching learning process and the health as applied to the health and disease issues because life is a series of educational experiences we can be affected by them positively and negatively but you can't avoid them it's just there and one of the major problems which we're going to hear a lot more about now with this uh, so-called health care legislation, it's disease care legislation. Um, people have got to begin to learn to take care of themselves, to understand better how they're put together, 
and what they can do to keep themselves together. Now there are those people who have, um, you know, um, disabilities and inherited diseases and a lot of that. But the majority of people, if they paid some attention to the way they lived, not only how they how they eat, but and the deck exercise they take, but their mental health, which is critical to a happy life for them and for anybody around them. And with the, this bill, if it passes the way it is, with no control on cost, no control on cost, it's a disaster as far as I'm concerned. It's an absolute disaster. Now, uh, all industrial countries that have what I would call, you know, a socialist program. I mean, it's, it's everybody gets it and they don't pay very much for it. They control the costs. Doctors get X dollars. Hospitals get X dollars. This thing is going to cost all of us. Your health insurance is, health insurance companies got to take people with pre-existing conditions. They should. Who's going to pay for it? All of us. No question about that. I mean, they've got to pay. They, unless insurance companies stop making money. But education is critical on, in the day-to-day -day encounters of people's personal lives when they enter the medical care system, and that's where it gets botched beautifully. I spent my last 14 years teaching at UMass Medical School, and my focus was, nobody paid any attention to me, you understand, <laughs> but my focus was, okay, You've got 20 minutes with this patient. What do you need to know about this as a person? I don't give a damn what's wrong with them. About a person to treat them most effectively. Now, a lot of the medical students would say, yeah, you're right, but I can't, even, I can't spend time doing that here in this system. I, I just can't do it. I had. Have I got time to tell a story? <laughs> yes, you do. You do. do. Yes. Um, I had a fourth year student <laughs> once, a very striking woman. She was tall and lean and not pretty, but arrested. You would look at her twice. And one of the courses that I taught was a tutorial for when they were spending their time in the field with a uh, uh, primary care physician. They had they had a uh, segment where they did this. So what I did was sit them down, say, I want you to observe the interaction between doctor and patient. What questions are asked? What questions are not asked? Uh, what's the what's the tone of this? And I had I developed a model. What do they know? What do they feel? What is their support system for survival? So she said to me, oh my goodness, you don't mean you think a doctor has got time to do this, do you? <laughs> and I thought, you know what, lady, you do protest too much. What's the matter with you? But anyway, as the uh, medical students are very, they, they do what they're told. That's the only way they get through medical school. And so, very task-oriented, so she took her lesson and off she went to the practice. I went out to see her in a couple of weeks, and she said to me, you know what, you're right. Those variables that you mentioned do occur, but you have to notice them. I said, you're right. And then she stopped and she said, there's something about you that bothers me terribly. <laughs> and I said, oh, what's that? She said, I don't know. But I have a need to acknowledge this so I don't punch you out today. Ooh. I thought, well, thank you very much. I don't wish to be punched out today. So we went on with the lesson, and she broke it in the middle of the sun. She said, I know what bothers me about you. I said, what's that? She said, you tap into my disillusionment. She said, everything you are teaching me, I believe a doctor should do. Everything. But she said, I got that knocked out of me the first three months I was here, and I had stuffed it and forgotten it until now. And I, she was a fourth year student, so she had an internship to go through. 
which is just as rigid and just as difficult as mm -hmm. the other. But I, I say that to illustrate the problem of trying to get people who practice medicine uh, to understand that, okay, you know all about the clinical issues, you're brilliant. What about this person? Mm -hmm. What about this human being? They are contributing to this in more ways than you realize. And you have to know who they are. Now I grant you, your insurance allows you only 15 minutes, but you can take this and you can gradually, over time, get to know who you're dealing with. There was a um, GP in Franklin, Dr. Pastorella, I think he delivered every baby in Franklin for a million years. And he said one day, you know what, just listen to a person long enough, you figure out what's wrong with them. But they don't spend any time listening. Mm -hmm. They've got their preconceived notion of what this diagnosis is, and that's what they deal with. And with all the tests and the machines around today, there's no connection. Anyway, how did I get home? Oh, Helen, what we need to do is talk. clone you and send you out all over the place. <laughs> there are so many good, good, good ideas, ideas that you have. Oh and, you know, it's too bad that a lot of what you were trying to do has, has disappeared. Well, well that it's we going to disappear more. It's going to be oh, worse. Oh, this is no, absolutely. Much worse. Absolutely. Much, much, much more. You can see why I was very nervous about coming on with Helen today. Oh, shit. <laughs> No, I really. No, I am smaller by the minute. No, no, I am just full of baloney. Yes. Um, look, um, but that that that's an aside. But you asked, and, and that's the best answer that I can give. That's you. A, it's very. Um, I I. It was not no fun doing this. The only place I had fun was when I went up to Amherst to teach the graduate public health students. That I loved. Mm. But it was no fun doing this. It was a very tough road to home. And I was very happy to retire. So, so how, it almost seems that being the first uh, select woman in this community, that was probably not an easy decision. And then even getting elected. Well, ignorance is bliss, you know. <laughs> and, and I, I um, you know, I, I just was amused by the objections that were raised. What are you going to do if the truck breaks down? Call the camp. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know? Really? Uh, uh, Pretty that, simple, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, now, women were not easily recognized. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, oh, no. Absolutely. I was the only woman on the Zoning Board of Appeals, and I talked one other one, please, into coming on board, and uh, she quit. She didn't stay. But I raised tough with the guys. But they they come in with you know, cowboy boots and dungarees. Dungarees were not a fashion statement then. Well, I've been in good clothes all day. And blah, blah. I said, look, these people are coming in. They're spending money to be heard, mm -hmm. which was not what it is today, with something important in their lives. The first impression they have is how you look. Mm -hmm. No matter how smart you are, first impression is appearance. Mm -hmm. I said, second is the fact, oh, ho, oh, oh, I, I, I want you to know three of them that I think I trained, became selectmen in this town. I won't name who they are, but anyway, uh, it was a few years ago. But they did a great job. Ho, ho, ho. I said, don't do that. They don't. They were good members, but the impression they were given, you know, I raised a uh, hell, ho, ho, heck with them. <laughs> but they were good guys, and they really were. But again, mm -hmm. it was taking it from a woman was a little difficult. Yes, oh, there's no oh, question. I'm sure. Oh, it must have been. You Look, were way ahead of your oh, time, I, both of I you. I came home in tears a couple of times. I really did. Um, Bill Coughlin, the sweetest guy you'd ever want to yep. know, our town accountant, came in front of the board for a variance. A variance, we were taught, was something that is not granted. 98% should be denied. And if those 2% that are granted a challenge, one of them would lose. That's how strict the thing is. Bill Coughlin came and he needed to extend his home, put on an extension on his home. And he was within the setback of 25 feet to the sideline. And he wanted a variance. Everybody loved Bill. He was a sweetheart. And the board all said, hey, no problem. All the neighbors came and said, there's no problem. We want Bill to have it, blah, blah, blah. Let everybody talk. And I said, you have to deny it. Well, you have to. I said, yes, you do. 
state law says that the variance must, the hardship must be with the location, not with the applicant. The applicant, Joe Santos taught us somebody had twins they needed to add on. The applicant is too prolific, there's nothing wrong with a house. Therefore, the variance cannot be granted because the the uh, problem is not with the app, not with the house, it's with the applicant. So you have to deny. And I kept it up until the board did deny. I came in the door and Richard said, how'd you make out? I started to cry. I said, I'm <laughs> Bill Coughlin, he's the sweetest guy in the world. And I do that. But I had to do the job. That's all there is to it. But as I say, we're still a little bit of the woman who oh, does oh, Bill no, Coughlin no, and all the neighbors, Nancy. I said, yeah, but you can have an attorney come later on, pull that file and say, no, I have a, uh, an applicant here who wants to do it. Oh, you, but you did. You can't. We can come back to bite you. You have to be very, very strict yeah, yeah, by the rules. We, um, you no, know, you're absolutely right, Nancy. There was, um, I mean, one of the problems that I saw pretty quickly, there was a lot of tax title land around, and the law requires the tax title land be advertised so that anyone who wishes to buy it can bid on it or pay the town's price or whatever. And the town treasurer had responsibility for this. The town treasurer was not being, he was illegal in that he never advertised it. He made it known to his friends in town and they were able to buy this tax title land. Now he didn't pocket any money or anything of that sort. But I called him on it. But he was a good it. friend. I, I called him on it and um, requested that he come to the selectman. Well, well, you'd <laughs> think I dropped a bomb on the town. But in any event, he, he eventually came, because he absolutely refused to do anything about what he was doing. So I said, OK, we're just going to take this over then, mm -hmm. because this is not fair other people and eventually he did it right but boy that was <laughs> oh, the old boys the old she boys the old boys the old boys I rules. sat at many a selectman's meeting talking to myself really because uh, they thought I was crazy to be concerned about some of the things I was concerned about like potential development and getting ready for it uh, but hey somehow that didn't bother me very much mm -hmm. I just <laughs> Well, I enjoyed it. I think uh, when Betty and Bonnie and I be wanted to interview women uh, for this Women's History Month, we never in our wildest imagination realized how many stories we were going to hear. And I think one of the greatest is that you two are perfect for this, our project, because you are so involved with the development, development of our town and you were ahead of your time because you were women doing these jobs that men had always done. And yeah. what perfect ladies to have for this project mm -hmm. that's concentrating on the history of women and what we have done and contributed to our communities. And, and this is wonderful that we're, you're, we're learning so much and all your stories have told us all this. It's well, I think also you've, you're, you've been such great role models because mm -hmm. Look at the, the women that are involved in our community today. And so you set a groundwork for, for all of them. And you know that's the thing that's so exciting about what's going on today with women. If we didn't have women like you, then you know, we wouldn't be where we are today. Richard, I hope you're watching this. And? <laughs> Richard's my husband. <laughs> Sorry, we'll I make sure that's not cut. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we appreciate this. True. We appreciate this opportunity. It really, it, it, it really. I, I don't want to quit. The, I don't want to quit. I want to come back to the, hear the yes. centennial, centennial stories. stories because you told us some fun ones before we started filming. And so can you tell us a little bit of that? Helen wasn't centennial. that involved. Hold on. Before you do the story, I got to switch tapes. So we wanted to get to. Uh, oh, Centennial, uh, 1970, uh, my husband was president of the Lions Club that year. And it was absolutely unbelievable how this town came together. There were several factions, there were the Anvils, and I believe they were who could grow, uh, grow the longest beard, and they had a, a, a contest on that. And it went on for weeks, it wasn't just a one week type thing. Another one was who could grow the biggest mustache. 
Uh, there were several floats in our parade represented. I'm sorry, I can't remember. We just had a tape, an old tape done on a DVD so we could see it. And I didn't have time to go over it. I would have liked to because it would help me remember. But uh, the Lions made one of the biggest floats. In fact, it won the parade. And it was made in Robson's barn. He's, uh, I'm not sure whether he's deceased or not, but he is out of town. Uh, the Frischlers live there now. Uh, and it had enough room. It was a life-size paper mache elephant. And inside was Paul Robson's small Jeep, which drove <laughs> us, which pulled a great big staging. It was a parade-type circus uh, demeanor. And it had levels of staging and steps like, a, like at a uh, football game, stands. And that had children of the town, plus it had the Miss Norfolk, who had won the Miss Norfolk parade. Uh, competition. She sat up with her crown on. And then behind was a, a cage with a live lion in it. This was the lions. And then we had the clowns walking around. My husband was one of them, still is. <laughs> and, then, and then we had the, the, what you call it, where they clean up everything. And he was all in white. And he had this, uh, the guy in front of him was all in black and so forth. I forget what his character was. But he had a cop kept going. He every so often clean up though. It dropped Robson right inside the truck. Would throw out this little pot of mud. And of course the sanitary engineer would have to go up this was and then he'd run over to the crowd like he was gonna throw it, but he had crepe paper in that he would throw <laughs> oh, out to the Anyway, as a, as this parade uh, came around, as this float came around the corner on the downtown, I looked up and I thought, oh, this is, oh, this is better than ours. <gasps> oh, it is ours. It took so long. If you worked on pots and bits and pieces, you didn't see the whole thing put together. There were a lot of parade floats in that. I can't remember some of them. Um, electric companies came. Um, uh, developers came. Wood people came. A lot of out-of-towners. But a lot of our own town people also did. And there were fashion shows. I know I, I commentated a fashion show. We had some wonderful sewers in town who made area. We looked up what was worn at that time, what was in. Uh, since I used Scotch tape on my hems, I went in Boston and rented one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this was the great big mutton sleeves, the whole thing. And it had all stays that held it up. I want you to know I feel very sorry for those who had to wear these oh, type of clothes. I have perfect posture on the stage. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, we put on a great show. And then Alan Mackey, our ex-registrar, who was also a selectman, and Eaton. Buddy Eaton. Buddy Eaton. Buddy Eaton. Two comedians. I'm trying to be very serious. I'm running a very serious fashion show. I'm a very serious person when I'm doing something, believe it or not. He came out, they came out in crazy clothes. They were raising heck during this performance, which of course, and the long one was great fun. In fact, one of them had such good fun, he went off with somebody else's wife and left town. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't Alan Mackey. Have a good time. And it wasn't Alan Mackey. But the town, nevertheless, the whole idea of it was so much togetherness. I mean, you just met people that, oh, you're an anvil. Nancy Connors, how are you? Yeah, this is great. Well, it, in the town, the smaller it's true, but the togetherness and so many things that went on and everybody participated in them was probably the best time of ever of this town. And I, I mean that only because of perhaps we were a part of it. But I have yet to see anything like that ever take place in this town that could match it. It well, really that, was That's what we've heard from other people. Other people, yeah. women that we yeah. have uh, yeah. interviewed. The same it thing. Special, that said, it was very special. A special time. Well, I wonder, I, I am drawing a conclusion because when you said when you ran and you, she um, scolded you because you said that in your area of town nobody, nobody ever, recognized his pond bill. Yeah. And she said that about all the other ones, but in this, for the centennial, they all came together and worked together for one project. Yeah, her criticism came true at that yeah. time. Yeah. You know, I don't know how much after that it took place. I mean, we still complain somewhat about Pondo, at least our streets now, uh, but they listen to us a lot more because it's a development we mm -hmm. have over there. Oh yes, that's your pot of gold over there. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> but other than that. Uh, I think one of the problems, you know, they had something to focus on and it yes. was fun. Yes. We don't have enough fun for some of the other things that's we right. do. Right. And uh, everybody can have fun. 
that everybody could get involved. In There's this. something for everybody. And they don't yes, necessarily oh, see yeah, themselves absolutely. as able to be involved in other kinds it's of a things. A golf carriage um, mm -hmm. yeah. But it, it was absolutely true that people would come to the selectmen. This is the worst problem in town. Well, it happened to be a problem in their little backyard. Yeah. Um, hardly the worst problem in town. But they saw things from their perspective. Mm -hmm. But that I don't I don't see that as existing anymore. I think that went out. That that went out. But I do want to say that for somebody that came into town kicking and screaming, and I did for quite a while. What the joy of eight miles to get even a loaf of bread? There's nothing, <laughs> no place for my kids to play with. Nobody, I mean, there was nobody. It's kind of nice. I'm kind of proud to be here. Mm -hmm. This is a beautiful time, despite some things. And if you got another row, I'll name them now. <laughs> <laughs> and before we end, we do want to find out, Helen, about your your meeting with the famous Julia Childs. We, can you ex tell, tell us a little bit about that? Well, um, Boston University opened a school of culinary arts in 86 or 87 or 88, or somewhere in there, 88 I guess it was, but anyway, uh, as a way of advertising the school, they uh, set up, they brought in world famous cooks, among them Julia Childs and Jack Papan and several others whose names I can't remember at this point. Uh, and if you chose to to uh, go in and watch them cook, you could do that if you gave them your month's pay. But if you wanted to cook with them, you had to really mortgage the house. Well, I chose to mortgage the house. And um, I went in, and I still have the recipe. It was um, goose, roast goose. And uh, she wanted fresh peas like spring peas. Well, this was November. I mean, you can't get the spring peas. So the students at the School of Culinary Arts who were helping her used frozen peas and cooked them and brought them to Julia and explained to her that they could not get fresh peas, but they had frozen them. She tasted them and she said, get them out of here. Get them out of here. They're terrible things. People had no frozen food. So we didn't have peas. <laughs> Uh, so you watched her do this in the morning, and then in the afternoon, if you mortgage the house, they broke the groups down into f four, groups of four. And uh, we made the same recipe that she'd made that day. And I asked the other three people in my group, you know, I figured they were people like me who just liked to cook. They were all professional cooks. And I said, what are you doing here? <laughs> they said, we want to be able to say that we cooked with Julia Childs. So um, she came around to each group, asked how you were doing, and um, did they need any help? And I was having a problem with some dough. So she stood there, she explained it to me, and she tried it out with me. I mean, it was like, this was the school teacher who was helping the kid out. Mm -hmm. She had plenty of time. She was absolutely delightful. So I have a picture in my dining room of Julia Childs and me. Great. And they say under I passed dough with Julia Child. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Ellen, I couldn't help it. I know you can. She knows I'm hopeless. She's been putting up with me forever. Um, <laughs> but that was that was uh, a wonderful experience. She, um, she, she is outside of her cooking completely. She's just a very good human being, and so is Jack Papan. They are, they were great pals, mm -hmm. and they're kind of fun to watch cooking together. So that's my story about you. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yes, that was thank you. wonderful. Thank you. We have really enjoyed it. It has been wonderful listening to all your stories, and we thank you for taking the time out. You haven't enjoyed day it any more than we have. We have learned a great deal yes. from both of you, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for, you for doing us. it. Thank I think you. this is a great idea. Good for you. I think so. Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I can look back to the time when uh, a woman 
could do three things when she graduated from college. She had to teach, she could be a secretary, she could be a nurse, mm -hmm. but preferably she'd get married. That was really, because I said to the counselor in my senior year in college, you know, I'd like to go into politics. And she said, ladies don't do things like that. <laughs> thought, well, I guess I'm not a lady. lady. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't do things like that. Um, well, from that day to today, I mean, it's amazing. Gigantic. Isn't it? yeah. The progress that have been made by women and by the African American community. Mm -hmm. You know that both groups, minority groups, have really made enormous strides over the years. Mm -hmm. And I listen to C-SPAN a lot, and there are so many women that are up there talking about economic policy and international issues and have these very good jobs and are running things, and I think, good for you. Just think. And they're not, they're not ancient either, they're young women. Mm -hmm. You were We've just early for your way. time, Helen. You were yeah. early for your time. Yeah. We've come a long way, and thank goodness now yeah. we can vote and, <laughs> and you know, do all of that. I'm flabbergasted every time I realize that women could not vote in this country until 1920. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, Abigail Adams agitated for that with her husband, and even yeah, she did. Yeah. She was another very strong woman, oh way God. ahead of her time. Yeah, she. Oh my God, she was way, way ahead. Way of ahead of her time. Yeah. And she, thank she, goodness she, for people like that. Yeah. But nobody paid any attention to it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and the actual push for women's suffrage, I think, began in 1869. Mm -hmm. My God, it was 50 years before they got to. Yeah. That's what bothers me about the stuff that's going on in Congress today. They are asking for major changes. They it's are. a generational process. This is not a political discussion. <laughs> I got warned early on, now I'm warned you late on. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, that's great. <laughs>